I came across a video the other day talking about chivalry and how the chivalric codes and the virtues they espoused, such as honor, mercy, courage, generosity, courtesy, were really just something the church came up with because of the badly behaving knights of the 12th century. If you research this concept on the internet, you'll run into quite a few arguments like this. Uh, they all kind of go roughly like this. Medieval knights in the high Middle Ages were really just armed thugs for the most part. It ran roughshod across the countryside. Armored rapists, I heard one individual call them. And so the story goes, they were arguably unpopular with various peoples of the land, understandably so. So in order not to have a lot of peasant uprisings or something, the church devised a clever scheme to keep the established order in place. They came up with this grand idea to rehabilitate the reputation of roving knights coming up with a bunch of knightly virtues like honor and courage and all that stuff. And not too long after that, troubadours, poets, and other hopeless romantics got caught up in all of this and created the tradition of the medieval romance. And many real world knights actually came to take these chivalric ideas very seriously. Therefore, these internet historians and interested lay folk conclude the idea of the chivalric code and other sorts of codes of honor are really just a bunch of sentiment and nonsense, nonsense cynically created by the church and other, epi, other upper echelons to maintain the established power hierarchy and keep the unwashed and unlittered rabble in their place. It's really just a manipulation that's really about power and has nothing of real value. They don't all say this, but this is the implication in many of these. Hi, I'm Dr. G, I'm a psychiatrist veteran. I'm also a fantasy author, and I happen to be a Jedi master. You want to like and subscribe. Here at the Imaginarium, we talk about science, psyche, and story, but today's video is about something very serious. Codes of honor and something called moral injury. In case you haven't figured out, I think that interpretation of why codes of honor came about is seriously lacking, and I'm here to dismiss that interpretation. Let me explain to you why I think not only is there a much more important and serious reason for such codes to emerge in times heavy with armed conflict, but even though it could be hijacked by those jockeying for power, and honestly, what isn't hijacked by people in power, the idea of a code of honor or code of conduct is a very real and very valuable aspect of one's identity. I think that it should be taken seriously. I don't ascribe to the self-refuting idea that all moral or ethical rules are arbitrary and relative. Let me explain. When I served in the Air Force, one of the main things I learned there were the Air Force core values. This was integrity first, service before self, excellence in everything we do. This was drilled into me during my officer training. I served proudly for seven years in the Air Force as a military psychiatrist. Back then I was Major Goodwin. And the core values were obviously an evolution of, in my opinion, those medieval chivalric codes. And many of the customs and courtesies of the military in general, such as saluting, are as well. Saluting, they'll tell you in um, officer training and other military training, is when knights had to raise their visors to recognize one another. They would look up, raise the visor up, much like a salute, like that. So that came about as a historical legacy. But what is the real story about such values? That's what I'm interested in talking about. What's interesting is that this so warrior code of honor, like chivalry, which throughout most of history was a men's code of honor, since most people involved in war were male, have emerged independently throughout history. In Japan, for example, you had the idea of Bushido, a code of honor that was expected of samurai. We mentioned the chivalric ideals, but you also see the same ideas discussed in ancient epics, such as the Iliad. And across ind indigenous cultures, all warriors have a code of conduct expected of them. It can vary quite a bit, but there's always a code of some kind. Why is this? Well, I think attributing the idea to the church and to the work of a couple of cynical power mongers is a lousy explanation and that it falls flat. I think there's a whole lot more to it. And it lies in the concept of moral injury. Moral injury is a term that was coined by Jonathan Shea, a military psychiatrist who, with many others, saw that veterans returning from Vietnam and later conflicts sometimes had more than just PTSD. 
PTSD or post-traumatic stress disorder, you see, is characterized solely as a response to being in danger. Moral injury, however, is something else entirely, or it was often piled on top of PTSD to generate even greater suffering. Moral injury has several definitions, but most simply, it's something that results from when you do something that you know is evil, even if you're ordered to, or if it seems that there's no alternative. In the literature on moral injury, you'll see it arise in those tasked to do things like torture people for information, gun down civilians, napalm villages, um, shoot enemies who have babies strapped to them, things like that. The rage and the terror of wartime situations can make one vulnerable to moral injury because by its nature, war puts people in no-win situations. War is not only hell, it's an evil enterprise altogether. Even when in some situations there is no alternative, there's just no easy answers here. Soldiers and veterans suffering from moral injury are sometimes permanently damaged and haunted by the things that they have done or did not prevent. I saw this over and over again in my military practice, and this is a well-known phenomenon. Such veterans feel alienated, cast out, like their soul has left them, akin to the soul death spoken of by St. Augustine, for example, or so many indigenous tribes who, who also describe this in terms of, quote, soul loss, unquote. Humans, except for psychopaths, see, I, I think are very inherently moral. Everyone has a conscience, even when we force ourselves to ignore it and it doesn't go away. This was symbolically described in the myth of Heracles, who, in a blind rage, killed his whole family and suffered a devastating moral injury as a result. This is not just a mere invention of troubadours and poets. In 2013, I published a paper on the dreams of soldiers who are in combat zones. There's a few videos I have. There are older ones on my channel that you can check out. I saw the effects of moral injury in real time in this in the study. When the soldiers had had confirmed kills, rather than just simply ones who had been attacked, they often would have specific dreams of fighting enemies or insurgents, only to discover to their horror that they had killed their beloved family members, much like the myth of Heracles described earlier. Killing inflicts a moral injury on the killer. Now, that doesn't mean that people can slip into a mode of thinking where killing they in the moment at least doesn't bother them but we'll talk about that in a minute in any case moral injury is not new it's baked into the human condition it can cause lifelong depression depression addictions and even self-harm self-killing it's been known since the earliest human reckoning and it's not going anywhere Modern soldiers suffer from moral injury and military commanders and military philosophers are aware of this issue and are working even today to try to mitigate it. One of the biggest problems we have is the dubious nature of the wars being carried out today in this age of so-called endless war. For the men and women with boots on the ground, you might not think it matters, but it does. They want to know that the terrible things that they have to do is for something other than just political cronyism, grabbing up oil, or whatever it is. And since they are the ones who have to pay for it, I think we owe it to ourselves as a nation to hold our government to a high standard of conduct. Because there's really only one way to soften the blow of moral injury that war often leaves us with no choice but to take, and that is codes of conduct. As I mentioned, these seem to emerge in areas of and times of high intensity conflict. It seems like it's a natural response because we've seen it happen so many times throughout history. And the chivalric code is no exception. In this time of chaos and war, roving bands of knights were wreaking havoc. That's very easy to do in high conflict time. See, war has an allure to it. It brings out the worst in us. It makes us morally confused and too eager to throw away scruples because, well, they're the enemy, they deserve it, right? It's very easy to give into that rage and that vengeful th thinking processes. The pro problem is it's a one-way trip. Once you go down that path, it takes over. And it makes it easy to give up the moral compass that you already had until you return to peacetime because the moral compass doesn't go away. And then once the dust clears and you've had time to think about everything that you did, that's when the moral injury can take its toll. And it can be devastating, if not lethal. So what do we do about it? Well, strict codes of conduct in war is one preventative. 
there are some military commanders that advocate for this and they will, they will say that they're unpopular. The people in war zones don't want to be bothered with concerns about fair play or by, you know, ethical standards and all that kind of thing. But when they come out through the other end of it, they are more often than not protected from moral injury and they're glad for it. They're at least protected to some degree, to the degree that it's possible. To protect us from moral degradation and moral injury, then that's one way that we can do it with a code of conduct that's strictly followed. This is why I think the reason why so many stories involving war, superheroes, knights of old, legendary wars, fantasy, such as what I like to write and read about, and just, you know, great epics, always seem to bring in the idea of a code of conduct. It's not just a mere pretty artifice. It's not a sentimental affectation. It's not born of cynical political manipulation. It's not even really learned by society, which is always a preamble to throwing the baby out with the bathwater. No, I think codes of conduct come from the soul. They are something that we need and we feel compelled to create when the environment is otherwise lacking. That's what I got for you today. See you next time.